All right. Uh, we just finished the Italian Renaissance. We're going to France. Uh, French Renaissance. Uh, theater, government controlled, most definitely. Um, the plays had to be approved to be produced. Cardinal Richelieu, um, he was the chief prime minister uh, of France, um, and he set up the French Academy. He set out to make uh, France the cultural capital of Europe. He squelched religious squabbles, didn't want anybody uh, arguing about religion anymore, said, so that's it, knock it off. He looked to Italy um, for ideals. He accepted perspective, proscenium, and the principles of theater. Um, and <clears throat> if for any reason these plays, this theater, did not follow these rules, they would say, nope, you can't do it, go back and do it again. Um, hardcore. Comedy of Manners. Um, these were plays that poked fun at the affectations, uh, manners, and conventions of society. These were the plays um, that were presented during this time and kind of reflective of that time. They used stock characters and situations once again. They used um, characters from the Commedia dell'arte. We'll talk about that in just a second. They employed what they were called um, the unities. Um, play had to be comic or tragedy, had to be a comedy or a tragedy, had to be one or the other, they did not mix. Italy, they mixed them, tragic comedy, kind of cool, kind of funny, hey, uh, France, whoosh, nope, it's got to be funny or it has to be tragic, that's just the way it is. Um, they did their plays in five acts, why? Uh, because the Greeks did, they went back to the Greeks and said, you know what, it worked for the Greeks, so we're going to go back to the Greeks, our plays will be written in five acts. Talking about the three unities, three big unities. Um, time. All action had to occur within 24 hours. That's it. Um, why? Because that's the way the Greeks did it as well. Place. Uh, all the action had to occur in one place. Um, no scene changes, nothing like that. It just stayed the same. And then action. Um, all action had only one plot, one storyline to follow beginning, middle, and end. That was it. And of course they uh, had uh, poetic justice. Poetic justice uh, was a theory where you reward the good and punish the evil. So any of your evil characters, they were punished. Any of your good characters, you were you would reward them. Um, that's what you would do. Also they employed a voice of reason in the plays as well. Someone who gave um, a character showed them the right way to do something. Do it like this and everything will be good. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. That's boring. That's, uh, I can't do that. I want to make it, you know, I want to have fun. Well, if you do that, you will pay the price. Um, so those are the unities. Um, also, during this time, um, the writers and the artists would incorporate the unit. Um, I'm sorry, the humors. This is not in the book. Um, the humors our humans psychological behavior is based on their health people and writers often associated body body fluids with their effect on the person or the character who had too much of them and I will explain if you had too much blood in your system um, and the earth sun that they associate with that is air you have too much blood and too much air is getting pumped through your body well here's what's going on with you were full of passion, full of laughter. You used, um, um, this is used to describe the lovers. They were ditzy, kind of like they're airheads. Um, they're love struck and they can't think of anything else but but boom, all they hear is their heart beating and driving them crazy with passion. Um, if you had too much urine or phlegm in your body, our son associated with this is water. These are for your characters who are sluggish or dull. Um, they always have to relieve themselves. They always have to go to the bathroom. <sighs> they don't really accomplish that much because they're always kind of shifting and trying to, they're always just a little off center and feeling comfortable. Okay, so if you got too much water, too much phlegm, you're usually sick. Um, and the characters who um, had too much of these fluids would feel that way. And that was also their uh, function in the plot as well. If you had characters who had too much black bile, well, the earth sign they associate with this is the earth. Um, they're melancholy or depressed. Um, they're full of blackness 
and introspective, kind of like Hamlet. Hamlet was uh, full of black bile. Um, and then you have um, yellow bile. If you have too much yellow bile in your system, you're full of fire, and that's the earth sign we associate with that fire. Um, and these characters are quick to anger. They're volatile. You never know where they're gonna come from. Um, you know, and their body just, you know, gets them fired up. So they would incorporate these bodily fluids uh, into the description of the character, and then also that gives them some place to go and define who these people are. The playwright we associate with the with the uh, Italian, I'm sorry, the French Renaissance is Moliere. His name is Jean Baptiste Poquelin, and he was the son of a. I got it here. He was the son of an upholsterer. Well, Chris, that's wonderful and great, but why is that uh, important to me? Well, I'll tell you why. Uh, because Jean Baptiste Pope Lynn, uh, his father, trained him to be an upholsterer, sent him to school, and um, once he graduated, he said, Hey, Dad, you know what? I really appreciate you uh, putting me through school and everything like that. And uh, what I'd really like to do with my life is uh, become an actor. What? His father said, What are you crazy? I just. Uh, I educated you to, uh, no, I didn't educate you to, so you can become an actor. No, you know, it's not what you're going to do. And he said, but dad, I'm, I'm really good at it. You know? um, and his dad basically said, you know what, if you want to do that, knock yourself out, but you can't use my name. So Jean-Baptiste Pope Willin chose the name Moliere um, as his pseudonym. Um, so after he did that, he went and he toured the provinces of France for um, 15 years. Um, he joined nine other young people in founding the Theatre Illustre. Um, and that's when he took the name Moliere. The company failed in Paris. It toured provinces for 15 years, polishing its skills, learning to please audiences, often in competition with Comédie Del Art troops. He's touring France for 15 years. And he's picking up, you know, he sees what's working for the Comédie troops and not. So he incorporated a lot of the comedia timing and business and characters into his works. Also, he employed women um, in his plays. Um, in 1658, the company was invited to play for the king, who was sufficiently pleased to let it use a court theater for public performances, which is huge. Moliere remained in Paris thereafter, often stirring up controversy with plays that satirized obsessive behavior and repressive customs but enjoying the favor of the king, for whose, uh, for whose festivals he wrote entertainments and who awarded the company an annual subsidy. So the king said, yep, you can use one of my theaters. I'm even going to give you some money. Moliere's enemies were often vicious, even spreading the rumor that his wife, some 20 years younger than he, was actually his illegitimate daughter. That's not nice. <clears throat> she wasn't. She was the daughter of one of his ex-girlfriends. Moliere virtually died on stage having taken ill while performing the title role in his play The Imaginary Invalid and surviving only a few hours. Initially denied a Christian burial because he was an actor, even back then. They said, nope, sorry, we can't put you in consecrated ground because, well, you're an actor. We know you're great and everything. We used to give you money as the king, but you can't do it. He was permitted uh, minimal ceremony and burial in consecrated ground only after the king stepped in. He said, you know what, this is a good guy. He deserves, you know, to be laid to rest properly. Um, but um, he's the one who wrote Tartuffe. Beautiful, wonderful play. He was an actor and a playwright. Uh, he wrote um, many plays. He headed his own theater troupe. Um, he established a troupe at the court of Louis XIV. He was influenced by the Comédie de l'Art. He wrote slapsticky comedies. Um, his writing style and acting style was known as fencing with couplets. And what that means is um, he, he would have one character, you know, throw out a couple of lines here, 
and then the other character would come back in and throw a couple lines out this way. You know what I mean? So they were going back and forth, kind of like a tennis match. Um, and, you know, one line over here, two lines over here, two lines over here. So they went back and forth. Um, style was known as fencing with couplets. Tartuffe, um, the play is known is uh, the, I guess, the social themes, um, the theme of the story is religious hypocrisy, uh, moderation, and forgiveness. There is a deus ex machina effect to where there seems to be trouble all over the place and at the last second somebody comes in and writes all the wrongs. You think, oh my gosh, how is that going to get resolved? And then with about three pages to go, you're like, boom, oh there it is, got it, totally understand. Um, that, uh, yeah. Um, the tragedy that we associate with this uh, uh, tragic play that we associate with the uh, French Renaissance is uh, The Cid by Corneille. And there were a couple of things about The Cid that they said, wait a second, we gotta, we got to work this out here. Let me see. Because they, they do a very nice job in your book. I'm breaking this down. I do apologize. I, like, I could read this myself. But I will read for you. All right. The Cid by Pierre Corneille became the most popular play yet written in France. Despite its popularity, the play was viciously attacked because it failed to adhere to some of the neoclassical rules. To settle this controversy, Richelieu, Cardinal Richelieu, asked the recently formed French Academy whose membership was restricted to the 40 most eminent literary figures of the day to deliver a verdict on the play. The Academy praised the play for many of its qualities but faulted it its deviations from the neoclassical rules. For example, although the play observed the unity of time, too many events, including an entire war, had occurred within a 24-hour period. The play failed to observe decorum because the aristocratic heroine agreed to marry the man who had killed her father only a few hours earlier. The French Academy's ruling on Le Cid is a watershed event, watershed event in French drama because it effectively legitimized the neoclassical view. After 1640, Corneille adopted the new mode, which was later perfected by Jean Racine. So, he wrote a play. And, um... Cardinal Richelieu said, yeah, that's not going to work. You need to go back in and take care of this thing and make sure that it follows the neoclassical unities. It's just the way it is, man. And you know what? He did. Um, there you go. That's um, Italian and French Renaissance. I hope this finds you very well. Once again, if you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email. Give me a phone call. Um, turn in your worksheets and let me know if there's something I can do to help you. Thanks.